The Total War series has many ardent fans and many who find it disappointing. And yet they will still play these games regardless of opinion because, simply put, they are the most ambitious games in their genre. You might not like Empire Total War, but you won't find a competing game coming along to improve on it. And if you did, it would be made by Creative Assembly. In fact, that's exactly what Napoleon Total War was. There are usually reasons behind the disappointing aspects of Total War, often money or time or creative conservatism, but let's be imaginative for a second and allow ourselves to invent some features for a Total War game that might make it just right. This list details a bunch of things I would love to see in a modern Total War game. Some are easy to implement, some are no doubt hard, but all of these ideas are plausible to me and have occurred to me at one point or another as a great way to improve the Total War experience. So I hope you're watching, CA. I've divided the list into campaign and battle features just to be neat, although some could affect both. In this first video, I'll cover campaign, then battles in another video coming very soon. So. Let's get going. Here, in the order I thought of them while writing my list, are my 13 most wanted Total War features for the campaign. Oh, and I don't exactly have footage to show with these features, hence the point of this video. So, enjoy some random, possibly relevant Total War footage while I rant. Number 1. Loads of turns per year. Starting off with an easy one, so easy that there are loads of mods that sort this out for half the Total War games already. The rationale behind increasing the turn count is twofold. Firstly, to increase the amount of game time you spend with the particular characters, making it more worthwhile to flesh out the roleplay. And secondly, to make the movement distances more plausible. The second one is actually more important for me. It always hampered my immersion when a journey that would take a month took a year just because of how much time a turn was meant to represent. Rather than give realistic movement distances, which would basically mean you can walk from anywhere in Europe to any other place in Europe in one turn, I think having the turns represent a week or two is better, basically how it worked in Fall of the Samurai that's quite close to being realistic in terms of movement distances. Number two. Wintering armies. In most ages and climates, campaigning with an army in winter was very difficult. I want it to be a bigger deal in Total War, which becomes a lot easier if there are loads of turns per year, since the rest of the seasons will be long enough to conduct and conclude operations before bunkering down for winter. I would like to see the concept of wintering armies be a thing as it was in history. Basically, during winter, you need a permanent base for an army to sustain it. In the field, with a simple encampment might be too hard to supply an army of any size, and in fact that's probably still true today. So I'd like to see the option to winter armies in a settlement, reducing the settlement's food supply and affecting the public order a fair bit, or the ability to build a long-term fortification like in Medieval 2, preferably lots of different types with optional upgrades based on how permanent, defensible and large you need it to be. This would be something, something like the Horde camps in Attila, probably static and required to be located in a place where you can gain supplies from the area. It might be in your own lands or perhaps in an enemy province you mostly control, but this is uh, leading into the realm of a later point in the list, so I'll leave the whole supply thing at this. Number 3. Public order being influence based. And by that, I basically mean making public order mechanics work like religion mechanics in the recent Total War games. That is to say that various factors will not change the order by a certain amount as they do now, but they will influence it towards a certain amount, with the strength of the influence depending on how far away they are currently from that amount, which is exactly how they do it for religious conversion. The basic idea is to get away from the notion that problems are cumulative over time, or having settlements get stuck at perfect public order. Hopefully an example will demonstrate what I'm thinking. Say you have your settlement with zero public order, you start taxing it. Taxing has a public order effect of minus 30. In the next turn your public order is minus 10, next time it's minus 18, then minus 22, then minus 25, gradually approaching the stable point for that issue but still stable. Now having the province constantly be at minus 30 public order might have consequences, but you might choose to live with them in exchange for increased budgets. If you give this settlement a nice governor who gives plus 10 public order, the order gradually shifts up to minus 20 and stabilizes, while in the current system it would be still declining at minus 20. Basically it combats the annoying public order balancing match and just lets you face the consequences of whatever level you allow your settlements to stabilize at. 
As for rebellions, instead of always getting rebellion at minus 100, you might have it so there was a chance of rebellion every turn in settlements that are stable but below, say, minus 50, so that if you're raking it in from taxing them, it's a gamble to see how long they'll take it for without starting a rebellion. I think this would be a good compromise between the guaranteed rebellions over some general's annoying wife that we have now, and the random full-scale rebellions in perfectly happy provinces that we saw back in Medieval 2. It is, I guess, something like the relationship between sanitation levels and disease probability in Attila, but perhaps with more variance, so there's a great chance of a small rebellion or a small chance of a big rebellion. All of that would just need balancing and testing, but I think that mechanic would lead to a better feature than what we have now. Or just do it like in Shogun 2. That achieves a similar avoidance of the constant balancing act. Number 4. Harder Replenishment of Armies My personal favourite replenishment system was the one in Empire, where if your army was damaged you could click a button in order to order replacements to join the regiments. This costs money, which makes sense since you are training and arming fresh troops, and I believe it didn't actually take effect until the next turn, to simulate the time of sorting this all out. Now I can totally see why a more basic system arrived later. Now replenishment always happens if you're in your own territory, unless there's a special reason for it not to happen. It's free as well, but instead you pay a unit's full upkeep even when it's weakened, which is helpful for keeping your turnly income more predictable. I just plain don't like it. I want to make the decision to replenish or not, perhaps unit by unit myself. I want depleted regiments to be cheap and to be able to expend a portion of their value to send in replacements, which would also hamper the movement of the army, which I think it actually does in Empire only a little bit. If in a settlement, perhaps replenishment could only take one turn, but then more in the field, since troops effectively have to walk from a supply centre, probably a nearby settlement. One caveat to all this, though, is that I want to change the way the game treats wounded men. In the older Total War games, you could get some of your men back after a battle in the form of casualties restored or something like that, basically saying they were only wounded to return to service after the battle. I think this should come back. I think after a battle, if you lost, say, 50% of your army, it should replenish over time to around 75% for free, because of troops with wounds that weren't permanent but took them out of the battle before needing healing in a camp. A losing army that routed probably wouldn't get this as the wounded would not keep up with the healthy troops in the escape leading to their death or capture. The exact amount you get back could correspond to how many non-service ending wounds actually occurred in the relevant time period, and is of course something that could be altered with army upgrades or having a proper base with hospitals nearby. With this wounding mechanic, you get a bit of both. You get the easy replenishment system and the micromanagey one I'm asking for. Everyone's happy. Or everyone's pissed. One of the two. Number 5. Campaign Map Fortification this is another simple one. In fact, you could already do this in Rome 1 and Medieval 2, but I'd like to see it taken further. As well as building little forts, I want to be able to expend great amounts of money to build castles or continuous fortifications like Hadrian's Wall, if I'm so worried about an attack and not so committed to expanding my frontier that it seems wise to do so. What you're essentially doing is building force multipliers, places that can be held by smaller numbers of troops against large armies, freeing up force to do other things. So one-time large expenses can save money in the long run, as your defensive forces can be much lighter and still expect to defeat invaders. I'm sure this needs careful limits, but I think it would be good to be creative. If I decide I want a massive ring of walls and towers around the whole of Rome, so invaders have to win multiple sieges to get in, and I've got an ungodly sum of money, let me do that. And of course, you can capture or destroy such defences made by other factions. Just wait till you see the look on the Chinese Emperor's face when he discovers what you did to his great wall. Number 6. Custom Province Grouping People have their opinions on the province system introduced in Rome too, where multiple regions are managed through the same interface. It was nice and quick to use, good for info at a glance, but seemed to reduce the apparent value of the individual locations. Plus, it reduced your choices for strategy since you really needed to take regions in your own provinces above all else to help manage public order and, in Rome too at least, unlock the buffs from edicts. 
So instead, here is what I think would really take the best of both sides. Let the player define the province regions. Easy as that. Perhaps the game starts with some setup to represent regions that were closely linked historically, but allows you to claim otherwise, setting up administrative areas for easy management and putting them where you think it helps you most, and most likely not including enemy territory to give you maximum control. Changing the province that a region is in might cause a temporary unrest to that province due to admin turmoil, or overturning decisions made by other factions about which places belong together could be quite costly, but I think it should be possible most importantly. So no more counting Sicily as part of southern Italy unless I decide it's easy to do it like that. Maybe I want Italy to be one province and combine Sicily with Corsica. Maybe I want them all to just sit on their own and I'll go around checking everything one by one. You can give me suggestions, or even start with all the provinces already set up, but just give me the final say. Number 7. Integrity Effects I really like the idea of integrity in Attila. But really, it was just public order, but without the effects on the game. I'm sure it does something if it gets really low, but after 120 hours plus playing the game, a lot of that on legendary difficulty, I've never actually seen integrity be low, so I can't confirm that. Anyway, all I really want is for A, integrity to be influence based, rather than just absolute like I said with public order earlier on, and B, for things to happen based on integrity level. So low integrity gives me a chance of a minor desertion, really low makes that full on mutiny possible, and conversely, high integrity gives me movement range buffs or battle buffs, but will be hard to maintain for long because there's an influence always pulling it back to a stable middle point. Maybe training at a base would influence it up to 70, then it would gradually decline to a baseline of 40 over time while they're away from the base, meaning that right at the start of the campaign the troops are fighting their best. Winning battles might bond to the men and bring it back up, so winning a lot can keep armies campaigns going for many turns, but eventually they'll want to rest and recoup at a base. The longer they don't do this, the lower the baseline integrity gets. After years you'll have an army that's at 20 integrity even with loads of positive integrity effects because it's being influenced down towards zero by war weariness. Get them resupplied, winter them in a city, retrain or re-equip them and you'll have them back into good order ready for the next sortie into enemy lands, putting that baseline back up to 70. This would add an aspect to your campaign plans that is sorely lacking and be historically realistic. Number 8. Supplies I've seen loads of people talking about this on forums, and I agree, it would be great to have supplies be a consideration in Total War. The way I envision it is that an army will have a supply line back to the nearest military base or settlement, a supply line that's visible on the map so that you can locate one for your enemy and send small teams to block the route, forcing it via a longer route, increasing enemy upkeep costs, or blocking it entirely, forcing the enemy to move back home, take attrition, or attempt to resupply from their locality. This adds in the mechanic of resupplying from your locality, something which would be historically based. I would say fundamentally an army should be able to resupply itself from the area it's walking through but with reduced movement points and reducing the public order and food supply of the region which may have consequences. If there isn't much food in the region already, this option might not be possible or causes extreme public order issues that will quickly lead to rebellion that will support the enemy against you or if you're doing it in your own lands, loss of control of that region. You'd have to think carefully about doing this in allied lands lest you turn them against you. A middle ground could be to upgrade the army with a baggage train before setting out. This would make it move slower, but not as slow as it would move if it had stopped to forage and steal food every day. Different sizes of train could be available to allow for different lengths of time without needing supplies, and you could even have an army stance to refill your baggage train by raiding the area around the army temporarily. Overall, supplies would likely become the focus of your campaign planning, which I for one am all for because that's pretty much how real wars are directed. Don't have enough supplies to conduct a three year siege of a castle? Then you can't do it, just like a real historical commander, you'll need to think of a way to overcome the enemy's supply advantage. Task forces raiding enemy supplies, buying it from locals, resupply by sea, there could be loads of extra bits and bobs you have going on across the campaign map involving this mechanic, making campaigns less likely to devolve into end turn fests or mindless steamrolling. Oh, and good luck supplying an army full of cav or elephants. Number 9. Minor Settlements in Regions this is another one that's been done before. 
I'm thinking that I want to return to the small towns on the map they had in Empire, with possibly important buildings being out there requiring protection away from your usual strong points. I think it was a useful addition, but could go a little further. Having lots of settlements, most of which don't have any campaign map building in them, but are just part of the region contributing to its overall economy. When an army comes into your territory, it might be able to capture these minor settlements with little to no interaction, perhaps via an occupy stance, effectively allowing them to occupy part of your region. This will reduce the value of the region, and furthermore, combined with the earlier point about supplies, might allow the invading army to gradually set up a new base of supply, sourcing food from the occupied area to allow a prolonged campaign against your region capital or local castles. Overall, it's all about giving you a reason to try and actively defend your lands, fortify borders, and even incentivize ideas like scorched earth policies. And of course, it gives you more options when attacking. Notice that a neighbour has a lot of upgraded farmland and wealthy small towns on your border? That would make it a lot easier to attack them, you know. I wonder if they realise what they've done. Poor guys, they won't see this one coming. Number 10. Global food supplies and trading. Okay, we're back to more simple ones now, although it's still about those damn supplies, kind of. I would like to be able, first, to export my food surplus for money to other factions who might not have a food surplus, or to be able to buy a food supply from the global market if I need to go through a deficit period. I don't want food-rich nations just sitting next to starving nations not doing anything. They would be fleecing those hungry buggers and getting rich. Or you'd get a situation like historical Rome, where it couldn't feed itself so it was dependent on buying food from Egypt, or just taking it once they conquered the place. Too much piracy or a blockaded port, and the famine is back. A risky game to play, but not having to build farming infrastructure in your own lands might allow greater benefits elsewhere. More options, and more realistic, another solid mechanic to add in my opinion. Number 11. More diplomacy options. Lots of people have ideas on what total war diplomacy should be like, and here to add to the pool are mine. Firstly, I would like more options when concluding a war. The Paradox strategy games do this well, allowing you to gain more leverage over the enemy depending on how the war is going. As soon as they notice they might be about to lose ground, they may be willing to make a minor concession in a peace deal. I want Total War to basically let me declare war on someone, blockade their ports, then have a chance of getting peace, perhaps with a small concession like information, lump sum food, or a change to their diplomacy with another faction. Oh yeah, that's one I found myself wishing for all the time, asking a faction to stop their war with someone. This could be useful if someone you want to ally with is at war with an existing ally or a similar situation, letting you use diplomacy to try and talk everyone down and create a coalition instead, hopefully benefiting you most in the end. I'd also like region trading back from the old Total War games, but also restoring regions, that is, region trading but giving them back land you have of theirs which they'll be much more in favour of getting compared to regular regions, helping you escape a mistaken war before you get steamrolled and lose that region anyway. Next, I want to see more options for talking to your allies. The war coordination targets added recently is a step towards this, but I want a little more. I want to be able to ask allies to loan me armies or units for a set period of time so that I commanded them, but then return them to their faction afterwards. I believe that would be a vaguely historical approach, especially if the allies are vassal or inferior party in the alliance. Of course, if you returned their unit with most of the men gone, they might not be too happy with you. Finally, there's a little something I'd like to see, which is having multiple ways to respond to offers. The AI does this, accepting happily or angrily, just rejecting or outright rejecting. I want similar options with effects on my relationships linked to them. Violently rejecting a trade deal and sending back the messenger's head in a box might be extreme, but I want the option, and if I take it, the other faction is going to know what's up and prepare for war, or if they're very inferior in strength, start groveling hard to stop me taking my aggression further. Similarly, if I give a groveling acceptance of a deal to a strong faction, they might assume I'm doing it out of weakness, prompting them to increase their interest in attacking me. Perhaps it was all a trick to lull their armies into an unwinnable war. Or maybe I reject an offer of alliance politely, even though I really needed it, just to appear confident to the AI because I think they're going to betray me. The intrigue. Give me some damn intrigue, CA. And better yet, make the AI do sneaky diplomacy against me too. I know it's probably impossible to program. I'm shooting high. 
Number 12. Player-driven faction types and policies. This is a big one, but one that for me would increase the potential for immersion quite a bit. I would like to be able to dictate the type of faction that I am to some extent. Currently we can change our religion, which is a start, but I'm thinking more. The ability to enact or repeal laws such as conscription to increase recruitment capacity, freeing slaves to improve order at an economic cost, or outlawing religions alternative to your own. But I'd also like to see changes in government type, like I seem to recall you could kind of do an empire total war. I want to be able to make the change from Republic to Empire as Rome if my family has enough characters with high influence. I want to be able to overthrow monarchies, install dictators, become a democracy or overturn one. All things that could change the global buffs and penalties and a variety of factors in the campaign. I think it should be hardest, i.e. cost the most money or influence, to move factions away from things they were historically or have been for a long time. So if I decide I want my Celtic tribe to suddenly become a regimented empire to rival Rome, I'll need a damn load of influence over my people to make it happen and suffer a lot of problems during the transition. But I want the option. Balanced so that it's valid with pros and cons to all approaches so that the player can roleplay as they please and create factions that suit their styles or strategic needs. Number 13. Custom Units Another giant one, one that might actually prove to be annoying in practice, but here's the idea anyway. I want to be able to define my own unit types. Now this would almost certainly use templates and historical setups to make it easier. I'm thinking along the lines of taking my line infantry, giving them a steel helmet and more training to create a custom unit of shock infantry, with the game balancing the cost and recruitment time to account for how unusual the unit is or how rare the materials and skills needed are. The cost of the thing could be tied to the industrial output and technological availability. If I'm playing an African tribe deep in the Sahara, and perhaps we're trading with a European power, I theoretically know about and have access to examples of full plate armour. But designing a regiment of plate armoured knights would cost way more than it would for said power since I don't really have the expertise to do it, but I want the option at least to have my one shock regiment of knights that I spend 10 turns training to give me an edge over the other tribes that don't. Other changes might be to make specialist units, like giving a unit a club instead of a blade so that they take more prisoners, or giving a unit a musician or banner carrier to buff their morale. It would be smaller changes I think that would be most used. Maybe I want my Germanic spear unit to have a throwing weapon. Sure, I can do that now, it just costs more to build, hire and maintain them. Maybe I decide to counterbalance the cost by also giving them less armour. I've created a heavy skirmish unit from my medium infantry unit with a few minor changes and can now train men for that unit. I think there'll be some difficulties in justifying this if you want to train men in things the culture wouldn't do, like hire a regiment of longbowmen in a culture that doesn't practice archery, but balancing the training time might make it all work out in the end. Basically it would be hard to create upgraded units, but easy to make side graded ones, just tweaks to make your own units perform as needed for your strategies, since as a general you could realistically train or equip your men differently for each campaign, so why not allow it in total war? So that's enough campaign ideas for now. I feel like I had some more but I've gone on for long enough and I can always come back later with more ideas. So now the question for you, noble viewer, is what you thought of these ideas. Do you have any you like, any you hate? Do you have any ideas of your own to suggest? You can dump all your thoughts in the comments and if you see other people's ideas that you like the look of, give them an upvote or reply to let them know. And while you do that, I am going to create the second part of this video, detailing my ideas for Total War Battles. Those ones are a little more controversial, I think, so that'll be good. <laughs> but until then, have a great time, and if you're watching CA, yes, I am available to hire. See you next time, everyone.